<clears throat> well, I've told you this morning we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verses 10 through 20. Actually, I'd like to read that as we begin. This morning we're going to be focusing on verse 10. This evening uh, we're going to be looking at verses 11, well, actually 11 and following. Let me just begin by reading this. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, and by the way, this isn't something just for them. This is something for all the churches and for the church throughout the ages. We all need to listen to this because, again, the, the warfare continues to the present day, and it will as long as, uh, well, as, long as the, the two kingdoms exist until the Lord comes and puts an end to the kingdom of darkness and brings in the everlasting kingdom of light. But this is what uh, Paul says to the Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth. To make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. That in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now the Lord tells us, as we've been noting throughout the service, that we are in a, a spiritual battle, a, a battle between two kingdoms. As a matter of fact, Ferguson reminded us of this fact when he pointed out how Jesus, in the upper room, was preparing his disciples for this battle. Ferguson reminded us that it began basically uh, when the Lord redeemed Adam and Eve after they had listened to the serpent when he had tempted them, when Satan had tempted them, and they fell. That's when it began. The, the entire rest of the Bible and the rest of history is simply the outworking of that warfare, and it's not going to end until Jesus returns. So until that time, the war continues and whether we realize it or not, whether we want to be in the battle or not, we are involved in this battle. As a matter of fact, our lives are immersed in it. We have to remember that the war isn't just out there. When we go to share the gospel with other people or when we see the things that are happening in the world or when the Lord calls us maybe to, to speak out against the things that people believe, that dishonor the Lord or things they do that dishonor Him. That's certainly a part of the warfare, but it's not the whole. The war is going on all around us. It's going on all the time, wherever we are, whatever we're doing. It's not just outside of us and the people around us, but it's also going on inside of us as we constantly need to struggle to put off our ungodly desires and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ to become like him. I mean, the fact that it's difficult, it, it's, that is the part of the warfare. And it's one that we are called to engage. Now, the interesting thing is, I mean, the Lord, if he wanted to, could put an end to all of this struggle all at once. He could give us victory over our sins. He could save everybody he intends to save at one time, bring everything to its conclusion. One day he's actually going to do that when he comes again. But that's not his plan right now. That's not where we're at right now. There are still many people to be born, people that he wants to call into the kingdom of heaven, people that he wants us to reach 
And so we need to continue to be here. We need to continue to be in this warfare. We need to continue to fight against our sins, against the world, against the prince of this world, if God's plan is to move forward. Now again, the point is, in this warfare, we are the Lord's soldiers. And if we're not fighting, then in a certain sense, we've already been defeated. We usually think of casualties of war as people who have maybe died, but I suppose it can also be people who are wounded who are taken out of the war. If we're not aware the war is going on, in a certain sense, we are those casualties because we have been neutralized. We're no longer engaging the battle. But of course, if we are listening and we're aware of the battle and we're doing what the Lord calls us to do, then we can be successful, then we can make progress. But in order to do that, there are certain things that we need. The same things that any good army needs in order to win the fight. I've been uh, watching a couple of movies lately that have to do with World War II and I've been reminded of, of warfare and this whole thing. And, and we see the similarities that are going on between that and you know, what's going on in our spiritual warfare. We know that in any war, soldiers must have a commander. They can't all just be doing what they want to do. There can't be anarchy and that army expect to win. There needs to be a chain of command. And that's why the Father has given to us His Son to be our commander, to be our captain, our general, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Soldiers need to listen to their commander and do what he says. I mean, he sees the big picture. He's the strategist. He understands the warfare. He knows what needs to be done. Well, Jesus sees and he understands and he knows what the Father has planned and he knows how to deploy us, how he intends to carry out that plan. And so he calls each of us to specific duties and we need to listen to him. And he speaks to us, of course, in his word. Soldiers need to be strong, which is why, of course, in, in the military, they go through basic training in order to give them a certain amount of endurance and strength, a certain amount of training. Again, as we're reminded, Jonathan Wong just went through and he passed through his training. Jesus <clears throat> trains us and he equips us and he gives to us the strength that we need in order to fight this battle. And of course, soldiers must also be equipped with some, uh, well, with equipment, offensive weapons, defensive weapons. Throughout history, soldiers have been equipped with differing kinds of weapons depending upon the particular age, arrows, spears, swords, guns, uh, perhaps something more powerful than that, uh, and with defensive armor. You know, whether it's nothing more than a steel helmet, which oddly in perhaps World War I as well as World War II, that's all the soldier had was a steel helmet to protect his head, nothing to protect his body. And it seems like we've learned a little bit more today. Today's soldier is equipped with body armor, um, Jesus has given to us this equipment in the same way. He's given us offensive weapons, His Word and prayer, and He's given to us armor in order to defend us, to protect our lives. Now today we're going to focus on those last two elements, the strength that we are called uh, to have in the Lord. Uh, that's what we're going to look at this morning and the equipment that he calls us to take up so that we might be able to stand against our enemy. That's what we're going to look at this evening. Now remember last week, Paul gave us really the first step, the first principle to becoming strong in the Lord, and that is to realize that we are weak and do not have that strength within ourselves. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10, he says, therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul says that he, he is thankful for the things that the Lord has brought into his life to remind him that he doesn't have the strength so that he might look to the Lord Jesus Christ for his strength. We need to realize we didn't come into this world with what we need to fight this particular battle. We need to accept this before we'll look to the one who actually can provide what we need for the battle. This morning, let's focus on the personal strength the Lord calls us to have 
in him. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 verse 10, and we're going to be reminded of this as we go through this, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, first of all, let's ask the question, what is Paul calling us to do here? Well, we're just reminded that the Lord brings the things that he does bring into our lives to show us just how weak we really are, how our natural strength isn't going to be enough for this warfare, either to resist the temptations that the enemy is going to bring against us or to do what Jesus is actually calling us to do. We need more. Now, recognizing our weakness, Paul tells us that there is something that we need to do about it. He says, be strong. Strengthen yourself for the battle. Become more than what you are right now. Now, you know, receiving and resting in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation is enough to, to save us. If you're trusting in Jesus, you're safe. You're going to make it to heaven. But it isn't enough for the battle. And what I mean by that is the initial trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if that's all that was necessary, Paul wouldn't have given us this command. We would already have what we need when we trusted in Jesus in the first place. And let me just clear that up a little bit in case it sounds a little bit odd. This is just simply another way of saying that we are justified by grace through faith alone. Salvation is God's free gift through the work of His Son. The, the, the word that theologians like to use is monergistic, which means mono, one person, ergo, working, one working alone, God working alone. He is the one who alone brings us to Himself and who gives us the grace to trust in Jesus in His work alone in order to save us. Salvation is God's work alone. But sanctification is a cooperative effort. It's called synergism, working with God. Not God alone, but now we work together with Him, as Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. He says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you think Martin Luther would have had difficulty with this passage? This is saying the same thing that James is basically telling us when he says faith without works is dead. Now, we need to remember that salvation is broader than justification, where we're declared righteous by God and where he accepts us into his family and we are saved. Salvation includes the entirety of the Christian life. Paul is not telling us here, work out your justification, save yourself through your works, but what he is saying is now that you've come to Christ through faith in his name and have been justified, there's a work you need to do, and that work is become strong in the Lord, among other things. Now, what do we need to do in order to become strong? Well, we need to look, of course, to Jesus and find his strength. Paul says in Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This is essentially the same thing Jesus was telling his disciples in the upper room. Again, as I would remind you, Dr. Ferguson was reminding us in John 15, verse 4, when Jesus says this, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus, using the analogy of the vine and the branches, he says that the branches draw from the vine their ability to bear fruit. In the same way, we need to draw from Jesus the virtue, as it were, the, the, the sap, the spiritual sap that we need the strength we need to be able to do what he calls us to do. But now what is this strength that we are to look for? Now we've already seen over the past couple of weeks that there are many resources in the Lord Jesus Christ, many things that he has promised to us, and all of these things could certainly be included. We know that Jesus has promised to give us whatever it is we need if we just simply ask. Ask and you shall receive. 
He's promised to give us wisdom if we look to him for wisdom and don't doubt. He has promised that he will open closed doors when we knock. That he'll make a way for us when there doesn't appear to be a way. That he will work all things that he brings into our lives together for good. Even as Paul already reminded us how the Lord was working all those distresses, persecutions, and sufferings together for his good by showing him how weak he was so that he might look to the Lord Jesus. All those things are true. He will even, of course, keep our souls, protect our souls from the enemy, and he will eventually bring us to heaven. But what has he promised to us to make us personally strong so that we can fight in this battle and have success? Well, Paul tells us that it is the strength of his might. Again, Ephesians 6, 4, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Another way of translating this strength of his might is the irresistible, sovereign, divine power of his strength. Be strong in that, he says. Well, now the question is, how can we do that? Or basically, what does it mean to do that? What is Paul talking about? Well, it's possible that he's referring to the power that Jesus exercises, this divine, sovereign, and irresistible power to protect us, sovereignly sending his angels to our defense. I mean, there are angels here right now that are ministering to us. We can't see them, but they're here, and they're here by the Lord's direction. Perhaps he means the Lord's power in ordering the circumstances of this world to work in our favor, or even the people of this world guiding and directing them. Maybe it's talking about how the Lord pours out his divine wrath upon the wicked in order to preserve the righteous. Certainly all those things were true. But I think Paul is, is focusing on a little bit more of what the Lord provides to strengthen us personally. Now, again, that could mean one of two things. It could mean the personal confidence that we should have that the Lord is going to do these things that we've just looked at to help us. And so we would understand what Paul is saying in this way. Strengthen yourself in the reality that he will exercise his sovereign power on your behalf. Be strong in the Lord. In other words, have confidence that he's going to do what he said he was going to do. But there's another possibility, and I think this is perhaps the right one, that there is a real communication, a transferal of this sovereign and divine power that Jesus gives to us that we should be looking for from him. And if you don't know what that is yet, you'll, I'm sure it's beginning perhaps to, to dawn on you. I do think that Paul is talking about this. We need to strengthen ourselves with his limitless and irresistible power. Now, what is that power? He's not talking here about physical strength, like what he gave to David's mighty men. You know, one of them was able to slay 100 people, or 800 people, actually. Or like Samson, who with the jawbone of a donkey, a fresh one, still full of water, he was able to crush the heads of something like a 1,000 Philistines. I don't think we should discount the idea that the Lord gives physical strength entirely because if we don't have much in the way of physical strength, if we become you know, lethargic and, and weak, I think we understand there's not, we're not going to be able to do as much as we might otherwise do in the service of the Lord. Now, I say that because from my own personal experience, I know when you get really weak and fatigued, you also feel spiritually weak and fatigued. There's a connection between the spirit and the body, and whatever affects one will affect the other. So I don't think we should discount that entirely, but I do think he's talking here primarily about spiritual strength, like what he gave to David when he went out against Goliath. I already pointed out, Jesus didn't give him superhuman strength. David didn't walk up to him and give him an uppercut and knock him out, but he gave him courage, and he gave him confidence, the confidence he needed to face somebody who was much larger, much stronger, much more experienced, much more intimidating than anything that perhaps David had faced before, even though he did fight a lion and a bear. This guy was a giant and an experienced warrior. Or like what he gave Peter, that moved Peter from cowering in a dark room 
you know, being afraid that soldiers are going to break through any minute and arrest them because they were followers of Jesus from being somebody who wasn't afraid to stand up publicly before the leaders of Israel even and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. Or like what he gave Paul. Remember, Paul was the destroyer of the church, but the Lord changed him from that to the greatest evangelist and church planter who ever lived and also, I would say, probably the man who faced the most opposition that anyone had ever faced and went through the most suffering besides our Lord Jesus that anyone has ever had to face. Now, this power, irresistible, sovereign, divine power is in Jesus. And Paul says we are to strengthen ourselves in that. Jesus makes it available to us. And again, what is this power? I think it's, it has to be the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is divine and irresistible and it's, it is the strength that, that Jesus gives to us and he is the one who actually makes us to be like these examples that we've just seen. It must be the Spirit of God. When Paul wrote what I'm about to read here to Timothy, I think he was saying essentially the same thing that he was writing to the Ephesians in our passage in 2 Timothy 1 verses 6 through 8. Timothy, for this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. This spirit that he gives to us is the Holy Spirit. We all have him if we're, if we're Christians, if we're believers, but notice again, as Paul says to the Ephesians, be strong in the Lord, he says to Timothy, kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you, and this gift of God is, is quite likely, again, that anointing of the Spirit of God. When the Spirit inhabits us, when the Spirit fills us, when he fills our souls, he makes us a powerful force for the Lord. He gives us the courage we need to overcome our fears. He gives us the strength we need to overcome temptation. He gives us the power we need to do what Jesus actually calls us to do and the willingness to suffer whatever we must suffer in following the Lord. And again, as Ferguson pointed out in our study, as Jesus told his disciples and he was preparing them for the warfare, he says, the more you are like me, the more you stand out from the world, the more you're different from the world, like I'm different from the world, the more the world is going to hate you and the more you're going to have to suffer for it. He says, be ready. So being recognized by the world as different is a good thing. But when the world does see that we're different, they will attack us and we will suffer. But the Spirit of God will give us the courage and the boldness to suffer for the Lord. So we are weak in ourselves, but there are resources in the Lord Jesus. There is everlasting strength. There is power. There is might. There are supplies that we can draw on through the Spirit. And by the way, every week when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that's actually what we're learning through this. We need Jesus to be our food and our drink, spiritual food and drink. But the way that he feeds us and the way that he gives us drink is by his Holy Spirit. It's not by eating the bread and the wine. This is meant to get us to look to him in order to receive the resources, the power that he has for us. So the final question is, how can we have more of his strength so that we are overcomers rather than those who are defeated. Well, again, the first step is stop looking to your own resources because you don't have them. Don't look at your own strength. As a matter of fact, if you happen to be really strong, that can be a downside. Just like we saw last week, if we happen to have resources in other areas, a lot of wisdom, a lot of money, we tend to look to those things for our help rather than to the Lord. So realize you're weak. Realize that you don't have what you need. And that will get you to look to His. Paul does say, be strong in the Lord. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. You need to look 
to Jesus. He says, secondly, be strong in the power of his might. Look to him for his Holy Spirit. Even as Paul commands us in Ephesians 5, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, this idea of being drunk with wine, again, means being under the influence of, of something other than the Spirit of God. And when you are called by the Lord to do something, to engage the battle, you, you don't want to be thinking that somehow you are saturated with the resources that you need and be under the control of those other things that you might be tempted to trust in. You need to be filled with the Spirit. When you're filled with the Spirit, you'll have the strength that you need. So we need to shake off the things that weaken us spiritually, the things that take hold of our hearts and sap us of strength. And we need to seek our strength in Him. And then we need to wait on Him. Look to Him and wait. Ask and wait until He supplies it. And that's why I read what I read for our meditation this morning in Isaiah 40, verses 28 through 31. I thought I would read it again. This, this is so encouraging. By the way, those of you who may have seen the movie Chariots of Fire, you recall they put these words in Eric Little's mouth as he was as he was running or as he was preaching after one of his runs, uh, and he was likening the strength to run that race to the strength the Lord gives us to run the Christian race, which is to live the Christian life. And he says that strength in both cases comes from the Lord. But, of course, for our purposes, the most important thing is the strength to run the Christian life. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. We need to obey this command, strengthen ourselves in the Lord and in the power of His might. We need continually to look to Him. By the way, that the, the, as you know, in the, in the Greek, there's different tenses for verbs like there is or like there are in English. And in the Greek, this particular one has the idea of a continual action. This isn't something you do only once. It's kind of like... Um, are we saved by looking to the Lord only once in our entire lives and that's all we ever have to do and we're saved? We go our merry way and do whatever we want to do? No, we need to continually trust in the Lord every day. Do we look to Him just once for strength and then that's it? No, we need continually to look to Him for strength. As we see in the book of Acts, the apostles were you know, continually looking to the Lord and He was continually pouring out His Holy Spirit and strengthening them so they could do this work. So this is something we need continually to do. And we also need continually to wait on Him. When we ask, look to Him and ask Him for those resources. We need to look eagerly and expectantly to Him. We need to believe that He's going to give us these things, to give us what He has promised. In the meantime, we need to use what He's already given us to continue to press forward and to push on toward Christ's likeness and to do the work that he calls us to do. In other words, use what you have, but continue to strengthen yourself in the Lord every day and look to him every day. And when it says wait on the Lord, it doesn't mean just kind of, you know, we, we, I think sometimes we, we do that, don't we? We, we? we just sort of sit and we wait, and it's like we're not going to do anything until we feel something, until I feel more encouraged or I feel more strength. But what the Lord means when it says wait upon him is, is look expectantly to him because he is going to give it to you. You need to act on the fact that he is going to do that and begin to move in that direction, or I should say continue to move in that direction because the Lord often doesn't give that strength until in faith we step out and begin to do what we've asked him for the strength to do. It'd be easy to do it the other way around, but the Lord is stretching us and he wants us to learn to trust in Him. So even if we don't feel like we can do it, we still need to do it and know that He is going to supply. So may the Lord give us the grace to do that. 
This evening we're going to consider again the defensive armor and the offensive weapons that the Lord has provided us uh, in the gospel. But for now, let's look to the Lord in our prayers and ask Him for that strength and the ability to look to Him every day for it and to trust Him for it. And let's also prepare ourselves to come to the table as we pray. So let, let's spend a few moments in prayer.